Okay. Second part of the program. Now we're going to transition from Patanjali yoga. That is the Theravadin Buddhist or the Patanjalian concentration practice into a subtler form of meditation. In other words, we're moving from Anava Upaya to Shambhava Upaya, what Adya Shanti would call true meditation. And in a moment, Westerford G is going to explain to us what that is and what distinguishes it from what we've been talking about thus far. So this, I would say, is part two of meditation in Shaivism. Remember, Adya Shanti is speaking from within like the Zen tradition. It comes from the Zen Buddhist tradition, which is a Mahayana tradition, very closely related to the Kashmir Shaiva like um, schools of Krama and Trika. So there's a huge overlap between Buddhism in its Vajrayana and Mahayana forms and Kashmir Shaivism in its Trika and Krama forms. So now we're going to enter into that. So I'm going to call this segment Meditation in Shaivism, part two, beyond Patanjali, going beyond Patanjali. So we're going to now go into a slightly more nuanced and sophisticated discussion and characterization of meditation. Before we do that, though, before I go into Westerfer's piece, I wonder if anybody in the Sangha would like to lead us in a short five, maybe even two minute guided meditation in the style of Patanjali. Any takers? Wait, let me just. Um, all right, take it away, brother. Okay. So um, we'll start with a, a mindfulness concentration practice here. Um, and just so we are aware of the orientation here, we can define mindfulness as non judgmental awareness of the present moment. Um, so there are three steps to this practice. Um, the three steps are one, take your seat, two, place your attention on the sensation of your breath, and three, notice when you're uh, distracted, label your thoughts thinking, and return your attention to the sensation of breathing. So I invite you to take your seat now. Um, you can feel your sit bones on the floor or the chair. Um, if you're on a chair, you can feel your feet on the ground, feel that nice grounded feeling. You can rest your hands on your legs or take a mudra if that's what you prefer. And then uh, feel your spine lengthening. It doesn't need to be completely straight, but, um, but feel that, that sensation of, of lengthening so that we have a nice long spine and broad open chest. Uh, for the posture here, uh, we can think not too loose, not too tight, or upright, but not uptight. And um, now I invite you to feel the sensation of your breath as it passes your nose, goes down your throat, through your lungs, and feel the rise of your lower belly on the inhale. And the fall of your lower belly on the exhale. So there's no need to control the breath in this practice. We're not trying to control the breath. We're just placing our attention on it. You may notice that as soon as you place your attention on the breath, there's an impulse to control it. That's, that's fine too. You don't need to even, to even resist that. Just, uh, just feel what it feels like to breathe. And, um, Keep your attention at this place on the lower abdomen. Then in the inhale, that moment in between the inhale and the exhale, the exhale, the moment in between, exhale and the inhale. And leave your attention here. You'll notice that thoughts come up and your attention wanders, whether it's to uh, sounds in the room or other sensations or most often thoughts. When this happens, uh, nothing's going wrong. You don't need to stop the thoughts. Uh, you just label it thinking and return your attention to the breath. So I'll leave a few moments of silence here for us to feel the sensation of breathing in our lower abdomens. Notice when we're distracted, label thoughts thinking and return our attention to the sensation of breathing.
It doesn't matter how many times we get distracted. It doesn't mean we're doing anything wrong. This is just an opportunity to start anew and to actually do the practice, which is noticing when we're distracted and refocusing on the sensation of breathing. All right, we can end the practice here. Uh, thank you so much for practicing with me and allowing me to guide you. And I invite you to keep this same uh, non-judgmental awareness of the present moment, the same attentiveness to greet the in entire experience of, of being here together uh, with, uh, with this same non-judgmental awareness as we transition to the next phase. Thank you. Okay. Um, that was, this is good actually, because um, mindfulness is a, is, it's a nice transition into uh, the next thing that we're gonna talk about because mindfulness is still a concentration practice. And thanks Nish, by the way, for all of your talk so far, it's been amazing. Um, but uh, while mindfulness is a concentration practice, shares a lot in common with yogic concentration practices, it is a little bit um, less control oriented. So uh, you'll notice with the instructions that I gave you for mindfulness, we're not controlling the breath like in pranayam. Um, we are simply noticing the natural rhythm and sensation of breathing. Um, and, uh, as we go into this, uh, next phase, I invite you to, uh, it's, I invite you to really relax and to be as natural as possible. Um, this style of meditation is not about controlling anything. In fact, it is about letting go of control. Um, so, uh, that is the orientation here. And I also want to add a disclaimer that I am only a student of this. I, um, I, I don't, I'm not a teacher um, and I have, haven't uh, actually tried to lead anyone in a guided practice, but I'll, I'll give it a shot after I read this excerpt. Um, so this is from True Meditation by Adya Shanti. Um, and yeah, I'll just give it a shot. True meditation has no direction, no goals or method. All methods aim at achieving a certain state of mind. All states are limited, impermanent, and conditioned. Fascination with states leads only to bondage and dependency. True meditation is abidance as primordial consciousness. True meditation appears in consciousness spontaneously when awareness is not fixated on objects of perception. When you first start to meditate, you notice that awareness is always focused on some object, on thoughts, bodily sensations, emotions, memories, sounds, etc. This is because the mind is conditioned to focus and contract upon objects. The mind then compulsively interprets what it is aware of, the object, in a mechanical and distorted way. It begins to draw conclusions and make assumptions according to past conditioning. In true meditation, all objects are left to their natural functioning. 
This means that no effort should be made to manipulate or suppress any object of awareness. In true meditation, the emphasis is on being awareness, not on being aware of objects, but on resting as primordial consciousness itself. Primordial awareness is the source in which all objects arise and subside as you gently relax into awareness, into listening, the mind's compulsive contraction around objects will fade. Silence of being will come more clearly into consciousness as a welcoming to rest and abide. In an attitude of open receptivity, free of any goal or anticipation, will facilitate the presence of silence and stillness to be revealed as your natural condition. Silence and stillness are not states and therefore cannot be produced or created. Silence is the non-state in which all states arise and subside. Silence, stillness, and awareness are not states and can never be perceived in their totality as objects. Silence itself is the eternal witness without form or attributes. As you rest more profoundly as the witness, all objects take on their natural functionality and awareness becomes free of the mind's compulsive contractions and identifications and returns to its natural non-state of presence. So uh, that is the excerpt and the general idea of true meditation. Um, I, uh, Anish and I had a conversation about the three upayas and um, I, I looked them up after that conversation. I found a, a great thing by uh, Harish Wallace. Um, and he said that the operative um, factor in Shambhava Upaya, what we're talking about now is will, Icha Shakti. Um, and I realized that's so perfect for Adyashanti's teachings of true meditation, because uh, what, what is happening in this practice is a letting go of the personal will. Um, a complete abandonment of trying to control experience to reach a specific state to accomplish something. Um, so I invite you to notice that your breath is still happening right now. It's been happening this entire time. And probably most of us weren't trying to make it happen, weren't consciously controlling it, uh, yet it's perfectly functional. Um, and even if our attention wasn't on it, we were still feeling that we were breathing. If you stopped, you would notice, you know. Um, and if we, uh, we feel a little bit more closely, you can feel that your heart is beating. Now you're not, you're not making your heart beat. How much effort is it taking for your heart to beat right now? So I, I invite you to kind of open to that level of effort, the level at which your breathing is breathing before you try to breathe, the level at which your heart is constantly beating. And just like your heart is always already beating, the orientation as we go through this guided practice is to that which always and already is. That which is prior to any attempt to produce a state, whether the state is stillness or silence or awareness, the orientation is to that which already is before, during, and after the attempt to control experience. So 
I invite you to take your seat again and uh, just sit in a way that you're comfortable. Um, if that means sitting like we sat for the earlier practice, go for it. If it means just sitting in your chair naturally, um, if it means even slumping a little bit, that's okay. Um, take a comfortable seat where you feel engaged and relaxed. And just allow the body to be still. We're not controlling the body into stillness. We're just allowing it to be still, allowing it to settle into a natural state of stillness. And once again, I invite you to feel your breath come in through your nose, travel down your throat, through your lungs, into your lower belly. And gently, uh, naturally, to just feel that, that belly rising and falling. And when you get distracted from that, you don't have to label your thoughts thinking or anything like that. Just notice distraction and feel, feel that breath coming in and out of your lungs. Feel it in the lower abdomen. And allow that same kind of energy of just naturally settling, not controlling the breath, just feeling it as it is. And just as we're allowing to, allowing the breath to be exactly as it is. While still feeling the breath, I allow you to, I invite you to allow your entire experience to be as it is. To relax, feel if, just notice if there's any attempt to control the mind, any attempt to reach a certain state. Um, any trying to get thoughts to go away, trying to pull the senses inward. And you don't even need to get rid of that attempt to control things. Just notice if it's there. We're just noticing and allowing right now. And feeling the breath. So as we're feeling our breath, allowing our whole experience to be as it is. We're still not willingly engaging in, with thought. We're not intentionally thinking about things right now. And if we notice that attention is becoming uh, trapped in thought, then that's fine. That's another thing that we allow to be as it is, but we gently, bring our attention back to that breath in the lower abdomen. Again, not trying to control or change things, just noticing what's happening. So I'll give us a few moments of silence to rest, feel our breath, and allow our experience to be as it naturally is.
you may notice with time, even as your mind wanders and is gently guided back to the sensation of breathing, that there's this sense of settled stability. And as that comes into consciousness, I invite you to relax attention. And notice that the feeling of concentrating on your breath is happening within a space. Paying attention to the breath is occurring within awareness. This whole experience, which we are allowing to be exactly as it is for right now, is occurring within this open space of awareness. Now, we're not trying to make an object out of this open space of awareness. We're simply recognizing that it is present. It's not a special kind of awareness. It's not a particular state of awareness. It's just this open sense of presence. And as you relax your body, relax your mind, relax your attention, you can sense this awareness, this presence throughout the totality of experience. Notice that without any attempt to make this awareness silent, and regardless of how many thoughts are in experience, this awareness itself is already silent. Any thought that could occur in experience, any sound that could occur in experience happens within the silent awareness. Notice as we let go of any attempt to still the mind, that this space of awareness is already still. That all movement is experienced in this stillness. Again, we're not making an object of concentration out of this sense of awareness. We're simply recognizing its natural presence. You may notice that your attention focuses in thoughts again, which is completely natural and a conditioned response that the mind has because it's used to concentrating on things. And that's fine. That is a perfectly normal uh, thing to happen and we're allowing that to be as it is. 
But also, if you notice it getting trapped in thoughts, we can either bring our attention back to the sensation of breathing or recognizing the natural presence of awareness. So we'll allow more silence here, just resting. Asking ourselves, not as a command, but just as a question, a curiosity. What is it like to allow everything to be as it is? As deeper and deeper layers of the attempt to control experience fall away, we can even allow the attempt, the intention to rest as awareness, even allow that intention to fall away. Even the effort to divert attention away from thought, we can relax. We still have this sense of curious engagement. What is the experience of allowing everything to be as it is through the totality of being? Okay, I invite you to allow your body to move a little bit, maybe wiggle your toes, whatever feels good and natural. To open your eyes and to notice that although the body is moving, although the eyes are open, although you're listening to my words and engaging with ideas, we can still have this sense of allowing everything to be as it is and noticing the natural stillness, the natural silence, the natural peace that is inherent to awareness um, and present throughout all experience in a totally unconditional, uncreated way, which you could never achieve and you could never lose. This is true meditation. Thank you for practicing with me. Oh.
सम्यग्बोधा विचारेना भावना मस्व भावतः लब्धा भोधो दयानंदम वंदे संस्थान मात्मनः ओम शांति 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 ही ओम by a proper samyak inquiry into bodha awareness itself one recognizes the void nature of all mental states bhavanam asvabhavataha labdha bodho dayanandam and having finished with this fascination with mental states one attains to the spontaneously arising joy that is inherent in awakeness itself that is the deity i worship Oh may this be an offering to that naturally joyful awakeness which even now I am oh peace 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 Om namo shivaya Beautiful brother that was beautiful thank you Thank you and could I could I say one word on yeah. inquiry as well um so in in this tradition um inquiry and meditation are intertwined with one another um inquiry is not simply to arrive at a rational conviction i am the self or there is no self or i am not the body i am not the mind um rather there's the primarily an experiential component to it so normally what happens is we'll engage in some meditation like i just uh took us through and then when there's that um kind of relaxation into the natural state of awareness um we introduce a question the um question should have something to do with the ultimate nature of reality and it should be a question you genuinely would like a resolution to um one of the most fundamental questions you can ask is what am i um and because you genuinely want the answer to that question you look what am i really so i'm looking right now and there are some sensations like there's the the tactile sensation of like hand arm body and there are sounds eventually there are thoughts particularly the thought, i don't know <laughs> because my mind doesn't have the answer to it but before that thought i don't know there's just silence there's just this open space it's an open question and um and what we do is we notice that before the mind goes off with answers answers of i don't know or i am this person or i am the self or i am no self or i am not this person any of that stuff there's this open space there's this silence um and so we kind of allow allow that to settle in when we really look for what we are there's not an answer in the mind if we are honest with ourselves and we genuinely look and genuinely want to know um so uh so after we kind of settle into that um you know there can be more inquiry if if the mind is really going and um you might have noticed during the guided meditation that it became so relaxed that it was almost like sleepy um that is not the intention of this practice um it's not supposed to be a dull state of blankness um and inquiry can kind of help the engagement here um it can bring some vitality back into it and it can give a uh, direction to the energy that still wants to do things still wants to control things still wants to find out what's going on wants to realize itself um that can be channeled into inquiry um and then then the inquiry itself doesn't end up with a a rational verbal answer it goes back into true meditation right we notice the absence of an answer in the mind of what am i and we allow that absence of an answer to be as it is just as we are doing with the totality of experience in meditation so it's a constant deepening of allowing the totality of experience to be what it is and 
this curious engagement of what am I really? Um, and they, they kind of just spiral deeper and deeper. And that, that is, um, that's, that's pretty much the idea of how meditation works in, in this tradition. Thanks. On a inquiry, I love that, you know, Ramana Maharshi, that's the famous story where his father dies and he's deeply, deeply disturbed by the death of his father. And he's so moved by this question of what is death that he goes to his bedroom, locks the door, lies. I don't know if he locked his door or not. I don't know if you could even lock the doors back then. Then he lies down on the floor um, in Shavasana and just engages in this radical experiential inquiry, not an intellectual investigation of metaphysics, not a rational linguistic exploration or inquiry into any kind of philosophical principle, but just an honest, sincere question about the nature of his being. What is it to die? What dies when death comes? And as a result of, as Westerford G is pointing out here, honest experiential inquiry, he arrives at this silence, which interestingly enough, this feeling of silence, stillness, not quite a feeling, but that sense, which is prior to any state, feels more me than anything feels like me. So this inquiry is a kind of like graded feeling, right? Feel into the body, is that me? Then feel into something prior to the body, thought, is that me? Then feel into something even more prior to that until you land, right? In the sense of spacious silence. Interestingly, that nothingness, that spaciousness, that silence, that void is what Kashmir Shaivism calls Shiva. It's like shh, va, va is in the vast. So shh, the silent vastness. That's not actually what Shiva, Shiva means blessedness, but this is an interpretive etymology. Shh. But interestingly, as you're pointing out, West Virginia, there is that energy, right? There is this sense of like energy that wants to do something. If suppressed, becomes tamasic and sleepy. And if not utilized, becomes frazzled. So there must be some guiding or channelizing of this motive force in us. So you could say the jnani, jnani will do this. The jnani will say, what do I do with this energy? Inquiry. The yogi will say, what do I do with this energy? Concentration. A note about um, the anchor that you use. So if you noticed, West Virginia guided us through this beautiful true meditation practice in which we were not trying to synthetically or artificially create any states. We're not controlling the breath. We're not controlling the mind. However, I did notice that often there was an anchor invoked, which was the breath. If we got caught, we simply have to notice the breath and use that as a bridge to relax back into the prior state, that state of stillness and spaciousness. To this end, I would say, West Virginia, what, what is being offered here is so accessible, it's so simple, it's so effortless that it's incredibly difficult. Do you understand that like, in order to access this practice, the level of sattva that you would need, and many people naturally have that sattvic predisposition, but the level of sattva you would need to be able to even understand what West Virginia is pointing out in the first place is like off the charts, right? And the level of conditioning that we're all um, indoctrinated with, this this kind of like doingness that we all feel um, is really hard to overcome. So this I would say is easy, direct, effortless, yet, very advanced. So I hope you can understand that there's like an inverse proportion. The more involved, so, uh, complicated, and effortful a practice is, the more beginner level it is. Do you see? Like ritual worship, so complex, right? So many things you have to do. It's for beginners. It's, it, it's in the Tantra said, it's the lowest form of practice is ritual worship. Higher than that is Japa. Higher than that is Samadhi. So notice what Westerfer is suggesting now is easier, is more direct is non-dual, it's, it's natural. However, it requires a certain level of sattvic predisposition already. So hopefully we can, I think now, move into a discussion of the upayas, right? Because that was a beautiful, so what Westerberg has done is he's taken us through mindfulness, distinguished it from yoga in its lack of control, and then transitioned from that. Because remember, Zogjen, all these things, they, they come from this mindfulness. Notice how Westerberg has transitioned from Buddhistic yoga into a Zogjen, Vajrayana, Zen yoga which is called in his phrase, true meditation, Adi Sanchi's phrase, true meditation. Okay, now let's just close this piece here. Maybe Makato, I know it's quite late where you are, so maybe we can go to Makato before we go into the next piece. Let me just close this piece now and say this. Let's, let's call this piece mindfulness, true meditation, and the void of Kashmir Shaivism. How about that? Right, is that, do you like that? Mindfulness, true meditation, and the void of Kashmir Shaivism feat featuring Wester for the sequel. <laughs> anyway, just note, just remember that in non-dual Shaivism, especially in its Trika and Krama variant, it's very rare that Shiva means blue meditating guy. 
right? In many cases, these traditions actively condescend to the yoga of Patanjali, them themselves being established in it. So I, I'm going to make the claim, these guys were all masters of Patanjali yoga. It's just that they found a better way, which I would argue arose naturally and spontaneously as a result of cultivation of attention. So because they achieved a certain level of like that, they, they discovered this and they taught this as a more direct practice. So if you encounter the word Shiva, it's synonymous with the word Shunya, the clear light of the void, Prakasha, Vimasha. So just note in Kashmir Shaivism, what is being called Shiva is what the Buddhists are calling no self, the ground of being, the still silent space, what the Christians might call the still small voice. So let's just close this section with that verse. Samyak, very Buddhistic phrase, right? Samyak. Bodha vicharena by a proper samyak vichara inquiry into awakeness. Westerfer clearly stated that inquiry is not intellectual or rational, rather, it's experiential. That, therefore, we have to say it's samyak vichara. It's not vichara, it's samyak vichara by a correct inquiry into what? Into my own sense of being here. I'm here now, I'm aware, I'm aware that I'm aware. It's self evident, self luminous. That awareness, I have to inquire into that experientially. As a result of doing that, do you know what I discovered? Asva bhavataha. I discovered the void nature of all bhavanas, all mental states. Samyag bhoda vicharena. Um, through this inquiry, I eventually discovered the void nature of everything. And then what happens? So bhavanam asva bhavata. Then what happens? Labdha. I gain bodho daya nandam. I gain the naturally spontaneously arising joy that is synonymous with consciousness itself. And that's the God I worship. Not any blue fella, not any trunk deity, not any woman riding a lion. You see, these traditions, like the Buddhists, are in many ways trying to differentiate themselves from like the, the sort of formal murti worshipping traditions that came before. So it's very Buddhistic and in many cases, Avaidic. So let's close it there. Samyak bodha vicharena, bhavana masva bhavataha. Labdha bodha dayanandam, vande sangsthanam atmanaha. This is the opening invocation of the Krama text. Um, Swabhodo Daya Manjari. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti.